Okay, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Tamlin. Um, I don't know where this comes from, but somebody's actually said, do something each day that scares you. So this is my thing for today and next week and probably the whole year. It's a bit of a personal challenge. I'm actually quite a shy, introverted person, so to stand up here and do this is quite a personal challenge. Maybe it's my five minutes of fame. Anyway, Mr. Um, Mrs. Ms. Kennington, Mr. T, you're off my Christmas card list too. So this morning I want to talk to you about the principles of design, which there are nine of, um, and I'm going to make some connections to life in general, and there's a cat. Principles of design is a tool for visual analysis, and many of you, um, especially those in the um, art course, are involved in examining images, so this would be a useful tool for you to use, and I know my students will learn about these too. It's also a way of creating images, so if you take these principles into account when you're designing something, you'll end up with really spectacular images. So these are probably used by creative people in lots of different pursuits, architects maybe, certainly artists and designers. Um, it's also a way of understanding images. You actually can read an image um, and some of these principles will help you do that. The world is a much more visual place now. When I was your age, there was no such thing as video. So the world has changed quite dramatically and we rely so much on images, so it's important to be able to understand what's going on in them. I'm going to present you with some of the artwork that I really love and hope you really enjoy it too. I'll also make connections to other subjects because I think art is sort of quite universal as a subject because it covers and, and um, it, it involves lots of other different disciplines. And as I said before, there's a cat, so there's something for everyone. This is the cat. Muriel, her name is, and there's more from her later. The principles of design are all interconnected, so it's actually quite hard to isolate them, but there are nine and certain features stand out for each one. So let's get started. I'm going to show you the images slowly so you can sort of look at them and think about what I might be talking about. Okay, so the first one is emphasis, and emphasis is obviously about catching your attention and the first thing that stands out in an artwork. We haven't got time to talk about all of these, but the first one is by an artist, or reputedly by an artist, called Banksy. No one's really sure because we're not really sure who he is. It actually appeared on a building in Bristol around the time of the Queen's Jubilee celebration. So not only has he used the red stripe across her face, to make you notice the image, but he's done some other things too. This is actually a combination of two things, obviously the Queen as a symbol, and you'd have to be my age to probably recognise what this, where the symbol comes from, but it's from David Bowie's Aladdin Sane. So emphasis can happen through other ways too. You can use contrast, colour, isolation. The unusual in an artwork will make it stand out or the level of sharpness. So for example, in photography, something might be really sharply focused and the rest of it's out of focus and that creates emphasis. Okay, uh, Leonardo da Vinci was a very clever person, obviously, but this painting is all about emphasis, among lots of other things, because everything in it was designed to emphasise the central figure in the painting, which is, of course, the Christ. So my message to you is, have something in your day that you emphasise, or every day have something, and place emphasis on the important things in your life. Okay, and the next one we will look at, so number two. And I think it's fairly obvious maybe what this one might be. Repetition. So repetition is the repeating of certain elements in an image. So it could be pattern, shape, lines, motives or symbols. And it actually relies on another one, pattern, which we'll talk about later. It also helps to create rhythm, which is another one, and it creates unity, which I'll talk about later on. It is actually the signature style for some artists. So, for example, Andy Warhol uses repetition quite a bit in many of his works. And if you're familiar with the Marilyn Monroe series, for example, you'll know what I'm talking about. Japanese artist Yayo Kasama does the same thing, but we'll look at her in a, little, in a minute. Actually, right now. 
If something works for you, repeat it. Keep doing it. If it doesn't, stop doing it. Otherwise, you might feel like you're trapped in one of her infinity rooms. Okay, the next one, and this is sort of reasonably obvious if you look closely at the images that I've chosen, is pattern. And pattern is also the repeating of lines, shapes, forms or colours. And the repeated part is referred to as the motif. There are two different types of patterns, natural patterns and man-made, or sorry, human-made patterns. And we could do a whole lecture on just pattern alone because it's such a complex area. And it's a significant concept in mathematics too. So that could form the material for lots and lots and lots of um, discussion in a lecture. Okay? Pattern is central in all of our lives. It's central to most cultures. Does anybody rec oh, whoops. Does anybody recognise this pattern? I went too far without the pattern, but I went too far and showed you it anyway. Okay, so this is obviously an iconic British brand that everybody or most people in the world are probably familiar with, but without the pattern, it's meaningless. Maybe we could hire them to redesign the school uniform, which unfortunately is quite patternless. Sorry. <laughs> And my message here is to f have some patterns in your life that you follow. So it's a little bit like repetition. If something's working for you, keep doing it. Okay, I told you Muru would pop in later. She was actually my research assistant for this project, but she spends far, far too much time on my laptop and I think I need to change the Wi-Fi password. Okay, let's keep moving with the next one. They, they get more and more difficult to sort of determine as we go on. So I chose the easier ones first. This one's probably not that difficult though. And as I said before, many of the examples have lots of different principles going on in them. So this one is about variety and changing things in an artwork to make it interesting. So straight lines next to curvy lines, different colours, different shapes put together, all add to that. And the last example by Roy Lichtenstein, he uses many different sorts of lines in this work to add variety. This is a saying that I try and live by actually, and it comes from a man, whoops, so I uh, called um, William Cowper, who was a poet. Variety is the very spice of life that gives it all its flavour. Okay, it's a scary image. It's actually a sculpture. Okay, so we're talking about proportion, and this is actually quite confusing. I get confused when I start thinking about this one because the mathematicians will use scale and proportion maybe in a different way. But proportion for me in a principle is about the relationship in an image between the elements that are in the image. So in this particular sculpture by Ron Muick, it's the fact that it is a sculpture in a space we're looking at the proportion of the size of the baby in relation to the space. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so the second example, I'm not sure whether this is about proportional scale though, because when you consider how small poppies actually are, Georgia O'Keeffe painted this image to be one metre across. So it's an incredibly large painting when you think about it of something quite small. But is that about scale or proportion? You can decide. My message here is that don't get things out of proportion. Some things are not worth worrying about. We are the truly lucky people with the privileged ones. Most people in the world can only dream of the advantages we have. OK. 
Okay, we're moving on to number six. The mathematicians will love this one because there's lots of mathematical language here. Okay, so we're talking about balance. Whoops. And there are three examples there. It's very, very easy. Oh, sorry, it's very, it's very easy to find works by unbalanced artists, but it's quite difficult to find unbalanced artworks. Well, they're probably not good artworks anyway. So there's things like symmetry going on here, radial or asymmetrical. So there's the mathematics language for the maths people. But Calder's um, sculpture relies on something that the scientists will understand. It's a kinetic sculpture. I wanted to choose something not so literal for this message. And so this is a painting by Muriel. No, I'm joking. It's actually by this person and it's called Balanced Life. And the person who painted this says of this, too much of one thing can end up creating stress. This is something that no one needs in their life. But living a life in balance can provide harmony and peace. I think that's a nice message to take from that. Okay, we, how are we doing? So we're moving on to number seven, which is movement. Okay, so the first painting by Marcel Duchamp tried to show that. And the reason he was interested in this is because the world at the time he was working was really changing. It was around the time of the Industrial Revolution and so there were lots of social changes going on and artists were thinking about how can we reflect this in the work we're doing and he was part of a lot of artists who were looking at creating new things but as again, that create, there was enough material there for a whole, new, a whole another lecture. Paint can't physically move, of course, but artists give the illusion or suggestion of movement by the way they use the paint. And Van Gogh's painting is a really, really good example because he's got so many short, sharp brush strokes there that follow certain directions. And the whole painting seems to undulate and move. And the sun radiates from the centre of the painting and covers everything in the painting with sort of a warmth. I think I feel a poem coming on. Think about movement in your life. Are you in a constable landscape? Do you want to be in a constable landscape? Or are you in a Kandinsky abstract? Do you want to be in that abstract? If your life was a painting, what would your final outcome look like? Okay, we're nearly there, number eight. So this one's a little bit harder to talk about because there are so many other things going on in these works, the other principles. But we're talking about the whole thing, the whole work, and it's about unity. And unity in an image provides cohesion. It sort of brings everything together, makes it look complete or finished. So in the Mondrian example, he uses shapes, forms, colour, but there's also rhythm and movement going on in that. You almost think that those lights or those colours are going to start flashing at you because they remind you of traffic lights or something or um, billboards and things, what it does for me. The harring one in the middle is characteristic of his style. So he uses this style in most of his work, which unites not only each individual piece, but the whole body of his work. So there are many principles going on in this particular work by Victor Vassarelli. I hope you can identify some of them now after we've looked at some of them. But the message here is to unite the elements in your life. Don't have compartments of different things going on. Put everything together, keep it simple and unite them. Okay, the last one, 
And again, there's so many different things going on in each of these, but I've picked out the last one to focus on. This is probably the hardest one and the most elusive one to talk about. But we're looking at rhythm and it's sort of akin to creating a musical beat in an image or something. Maybe the music teachers can sort of argue with me about that. And it works with movement too to create those things in a work. So, for example, the first painting by Delaunay relies on concentric circles and sort of has a flowing rhythm. The Grant Wood painting is a little bit harder to talk about because he's using converging lines and undulating lines in the landscape to sort of create that with the overall rhythm. Rhythm and life. So for me this painting says it all. It's just a, such a joyous celebration in itself. So find your own rhythm and dance like no one is looking. At this point in the lecture, I was actually going to put some music on and do a funky dance, but no one needs to see a 63-year-old art teacher do that. Why the cats? For me, cats epitomise perfect design. And if you're a cat person, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Whoever designed the cat knew what they were doing, how they look, how they move, how they behave, how they sound, everything about them. And they sleep for 18 hours a day. That's a rhythm I could get into. And just to imprint this on your memory, Muriel is going to come back and show them to you again. So we have emphasis, repetition, pattern, variety, proportion, balance, movement, unity and rhythm. Thank you very much.